Hey everyone, we are back. This is the continuation of our unit six. I already warned us and cautioned that the unit is a bit dense, but it is not impossible to, to engage the content there if you study it in a, a bit more organized manner. So the second part of your unit six for critical thinking, practical reasoning is focusing now on the types of deductive forms. I'm sure that the first part, part one, already touched on uh, modus ponens and modus tollens. So we'll focus a little bit on it now so that you can, you can get the point. So now we are dealing with the types of valid deductive syllogisms. Okay, your textbook you see four of them. Modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, and disjunctive syllogism. They are valid. You will see that as we take them one, one after the other, I'll be showing you the deviation of each. Deviation here meaning you want to do modus ponens, but you don't do it well, you could create a fallacy. That is a deviation, an error, a wrong way of doing that one, okay? And they are all also syllogism. So I'll, I'll be pointing them out to you. Now, modus ponens, recall what we did in the earlier slide. We don't, we'll just touch on it and move on, but we have looked at it already. If you don't remember this one, you don't know, then you quickly refer to the part one of your unit six that I uploaded earlier today. I'm building on that. So modus ponens is a valid form. It's also called affirming the antecedent. We already saw that antecedent is what the that is I'm pointing to something, the first part of your conditional. For this, at this stage, I could use that to help you. Okay, all mangoes are fruit. I'm saying if X is a mango, then X is the fruit. By that, when I open it out that way, you see it as a conditional. If it is like this, as a universal generalization that is all so and so, so and so. It's not always too clear. You, you may not always know what your antecedent is, but when you open it out, how? If I say all mangoes are fruit, I already told you that is another way of saying if X is a mango, then X is a fruit. Now that will then show you what your if clause is. If X is a mango, so mango becomes our, our antecedent, X is a mango becomes our antecedent. Then what will follow the consequent to be what X is a fruit. So modus ponens pattern says after your universal, what do you do next? Affirm the antecedent. It means bring the antecedent next as it was given to you. If it was originally negative, you bring it down as a negative. If it was originally positive, as we have in this scenario, you repeat it just as it is. So the, all mangoes are fruits. This thing is a mango. So we can conclude, therefore, it is a fruit. And that will be valid. That validity pattern is called modus ponens or affirming the antecedents. You shouldn't say that all mangoes are fruits. This thing is a fruit. So we should accept it to be a mango. That would not be valid. Why? Because if I say this thing is a fruit, I am only affirming the consequent, rather. I should affirm the antecedent. If I want to affirm, you should affirm the antecedent. Then the conclusion can also be the affirmation of the consequent. That's not a problem. Where we would have a problem is when right after your conditional, in the premises, after you affirm, the, you decide to affirm the consequent, rather, and conclude with your affirmation of the antecedent. That we say is a fallacy. So we name the fallacy, as I already said, by the mediating premise. After the universal premise, you conclude here. So the name of the argument, whether fallacy or valid, is, is dependent on what happens in your second premise. After you, your universal, what did you do next? Did you affirm? The antecedent, and then afterwards concluded by affirming the consequence. That's okay. 
because this affirmation will be in the conclusion. That will be valid. All right, by modus ponens. Now, I wanted to say something quickly here so I don't forget. I'm saying that if the original statement had a negative in it, if I said, eh, all mangoes are not fruits, listen to what I said. If I said, if you do not have a passport, for example, then you will not travel. The original statement says, if you do not have a passport, then you will not travel. That's what I gave you. Affirming the antecedent to say, X does not have a passport. So X will not travel. And these not not here, I didn't introduce them. I just picked them as they were given to me in the original premise and repeated them. So affirming the antecedent simply means pick whatever was given to you in the antecedent as it was given to you and paste. Then conclude by picking whatever was given to you in your consequent as your conclusion. If you do that, it will be valid. But when we come to modus tollens, like we saw, the rule tells you to negate the consequent right after your universal. What you do next is to negate the consequent. Negate means if the original is positive, you will turn it into what? Not a fruit here. I'm pointing to the screen as I teach. So please follow me. Okay. Our mangoes are fruit. This thing is not a fruit. What you have done is you have negated the consequent first. Then you now conclude. So it's a conclusion. You conclude. So this thing is not a mango. You now conclude by negating the antecedent. All right. So if the original was a not, then a negation of it will become positive. And if the original is a positive, then its negation will be obviously what? negative. That means if I had said in the original statement, Buddhist stolen, I'd said, if you do not have a passport, then you cannot travel. Then I asked you to use Kofi, like we did during our interactive session, to develop a modus tollens valid pattern. Use Kofi sleep so we can have a uniformity. If you do not have a passport, then you cannot travel. That would be our first premise. We are doing modus tollens now. The second premise would say Kofi can travel. That would mean I have negated the consequent first. Kofi can travel. Therefore, Kofi has a passport. This conclusion is also a negation of what is up there in the antecedent. Because I said, if you do not have a passport, then you cannot travel. Cannot travel is a consequence. So we bring that first and turn it upside down. That's what negation is. And make it what can travel. Then you conclude, therefore, Kofi has a passport. Now, if I do that, I have actually negated both consequent and antecedent, like the rule says. And I brought the consequent first as part of the premises and concluded with the antecedent. Remember, both were already negated. Okay, so if the original is positive, the, uh, the, the negation will be negative and vice versa. Negative, negative, remember. Two negatives will create a positive. So if you negate an original negative, it will become positive. Now, what we have just done, which we saw in the part one, really, is what we call modus tollens pattern of reasoning. It is also valid. So it means if you would do a correct valid modus tollens, right after your universal, you negate the consequent next. Then you conclude with the negation of the antecedent. Now we will have a fallacy on our hands, a formal fallacy at that, just like we had a fallacy up here when we affirmed the consequent, rather. We will also have a fallacy when we negate the antecedent. I told you where we look at to determine the name of the fallacy is the second premise, okay. the young one, not the mother premise, but the baby premise there, okay. So, if we go and negate the antecedent after our universal system, that will be the fallacy, the big fallacy, problematic one. We call it the fallacy of 
negating or if you like denying what the, the antecedent instead of the consequence. Okay. Now, an example would be from our screen now. If we said all oh, mangoes are fruits, then you want to say that this thing is not a mango. So you are concluding that therefore it is not a fruit. That is a fallacy. Don't say that, uh, oh, doc, I agree with you, that is a fallacy because you know, it's not only mango that is, not, that is not, we are not looking at even the actuality of it. We are just saying that the pattern, look at the form. If everything called M um, mango, chichi, let's use our chichi again. If everything called chichi is a chacha, so that you don't interpret it by the meaning of the subject matter. I don't want you to do that because the subject matter may be different. It might even be contradictory or it might even offend what we would normally think of. Like I give you an example. My lecture is a, an elephant or elephant so and so and so. Therefore, it will follow validly even though we know that you're like, you are not taught by elephants, you see. <laughs> so I don't want you to interpret validity in terms of the subject matter. So see, I could have said, all oh, teachers are churches. This thing is not a chacha. It has to follow that it is not a chichi. And we don't know what chichi and chacha we refer to. Okay. And so I, I, I think the point I wanted to make is if we say all oh, chichis are chachi, then you come and say this thing is not a chichi. So we should conclude that it is not a chacha. We have a problem with you. If you negate the antecedent, you can't conclude necessarily that the negation of the consequent is true. No. If I say all fantasies like to joke or are jokers, let's say that we put some a If I say all fantasies, we pursue all fantasies are jokers. Having said all jokers are fantasies. <laughs> I know the same, my dear friend. I say all fantasies are jokers. There is room for my dear guys to be also jokers and others to be jokers and not just to be jokers. You see, so jokers become a big set. All fantasies belong to the set of this. All these belong to the set. So back to our example on the screen. All mangoes are fruits. Doesn't mean all fruits are mangoes. Fruit is the bigger set, the subset inside of that. Remember your Venn diagram. I'm shuddering not to mention that because some people are mass phobia. When you add mass to logic, they will oh, they'll give up. <laughs> so I'm very strategic in how I'm presenting this to you. I hope that it will it will sink. But remember subset. So if I say all mangoes are fruits, think of fruit as a rectangle and the mango as one circle within the rectangle. But remember, within the rectangle, we could have triangle, which is what? A set of bananas. And still within it, we can have a, a square shape, which will represent maybe tangerine or orange. So there will be several subsets within the big set called fruits. One of those subsets within the big set is what we have labeled as mangoes. So if I say all mangoes are fruits, then my second premise mistakenly, I'm now showing the error, mistakenly tells me that this thing is not a mango. That only means the thing is not inside the set, the circle there, the circle of mangoes, you see? But it doesn't mean it cannot still be in the big rectangular set necessarily. It could be outside of the circle of mangoes, but still inside the big set of fruits, which is the rectangle. That is why if you say this thing is not a mango, the wrong one, when negate your antecedent, and therefore you want to conclude that therefore it is not a fruit, you will see that is a fallacy because given those two premises, we do not necessarily, necessarily arrive at the, the negation of the consequence, okay? So the correct way, I use that to help you. All the others have reasons. You can interrogate the logic of it, why it is a fallacy. We don't need to know all of it. But sometimes when you show people why that is wrong, 
Then the missus said, oh, okay. So just obey the rules, the format for G dash. Who do stolens correctly than does not deny its antecedent. Antecedent is the first. It must come before consequent time. Why do you want to deny? Keep that in mind and then you can always remember. Remember the pattern must be consistently done to the end. Not that you deny the, uh, the correct one, the consequent, and then when you finish in the antecedent, you, you keep it as it is. It will still not be valid. Okay, so there is a complete pattern to follow, to have a correct, valid pattern that you can label as modus stolen or modus spooning. Now we can move to the third type of valid deduction. We call that your textbook shows you the hypothetical syllogism. Now you see that this one is not a modus. <laughs> it's not a modus timuti or modus po. This is hypothetical syllogism, but it is still valid. How, what is the clue? Since you are doing only four of them, I like to give students some quick clues, but I don't like the bypass. So just know the clue. That will lead you and still interrogate to make sure that you have a full part. Okay. So see this hypothetical syllogism, first of all, all three statements, the two premises and their conclusion alike, all the three of them will be universal generalization or conditional statements. Since you now understand that universal generalizations are still conditional statements. All the three of them, the two premises and the conclusion together, each one of them will be a universal. So see this one, all mangoes are so and so and so, all fruits are so and so, so all mangoes are so and so. That should give you a clue that we are nearer to hypothetical something. It is not enough yet. People, you'll have to make sure that the full pattern is followed, I'm going to show you. But at least if it's an exam or you are interrogating a paper, the person says all oh, mangoes are this, the second person says all oh, fruits are that, the, and then the conclusion to is saying all oh, so, so and so and so, so and so, then it means it can be modus anything, whether modus tolens or modus ponens won't apply. Why? Because for modus, there is only one generalization or conditional in the premises. The other two are particular statements. I'm going to engage you in general versus particular shortly. I hope I, I don't have to do a 10, but if I have to, I would. I don't want to lengthy videos. So if it's 40 minutes, 45, I cut it, then you have a complete thought today. You don't have to listen to two hours. You might miss some, some things if you don't get to the end of it. Okay. So I'll show you particular and general shortly. But see, this is talking about all. This is also talking about all. This is also talking about all. That is why this is likely a hypothetical syllogism. Modus ponens will start with an all so and so as so and so, but the next premise will be specific. This so and so is this, and the third one so so and so is this. They are to be particular. So modus ponens and modus tollens, where you have to choose an option to describe a given passage, you should be guided by this part. Okay. Now you will see that the fourth one, which we are here to go to. Doesn't even start with all so so and so also so and so. It's a disjunctive syllogism. It's a different compound altogether. It's dealing with an either or. Okay. Those of you who do elements of formal logic with me, hopefully, with philosophy, you would see that we will call this a disjunction. Disjunction is not conditional. Just like in mathematics, addition is not division. They are not the same. In mathematical, the operation. It's not the same. So here, in a disjunctive syllogism, the key compound there, the connective term there is either or. You see, whilst in hypothetical syllogism, the compound there is if then. It's a conditional sign. Okay. Okay. So those should help you keep memory of the types of valid forms. Now, what is the pattern for hypothetical syllogism? You are supposed to create the sign Z in the reasoning pattern. Z, what you call Z, Q, R, S, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, Z. I have to create that pattern. It might go forward like that, or it could go backwards. But either way, you should have it, the form, the pattern, what Z. So let's look at this. Hypothetical syllogism. All mangoes are fruits. That's the first premise. See the second premise. You see that here, we ended with fruits. So all mangoes are fruits. 
Then now we say all fruits are edible. So it will have to follow that all mangoes from the beginning are what? Edible. See that all mangoes take us to fruits. Then all fruits take us to what? Edible. That should mean that all mangoes will take us to edible. Now the pattern is mangoes generate fruits. The fruit is here a consequence. But look at the next premise. The fruit now becomes an antecedent. So there's a bridge created. It ends here, it begins here. Common denominator. Then it means we will cross out fruit and the variables will be left with will be the mangoes that began and then the edible that ended the whole process. Okay, that's how can we end it. So all mangoes are edible. It's like there's a common factor that crosses out. If we were plotting on a Venn diagram, all mangoes would be inside a set of fruits, say square, then all fruit will itself be inside a set of what? Edible. So we would have had an intersection within an intersection within a bigger set. Okay. If you plotted the premises, you see that the obvious conclusion would be that then all mangoes, the smaller set, is already inside the very big grammar set. Okay. That is the reasoning behind hypothetical syllogism. You should be careful not to do the wrong one. They are so imitative of the original that they have all attained names for themselves, like we have seen so far with affirming the consequence, the fallacy, and then affirming, excuse me, denying the antecedent, also a fallacy. We have seen those two. They look like the, that, that fake dollar is so alike, <laughs> like the original, that they have also attained a name for themselves. So that is what is happening with this. For hypothetical syllogism, the former fallacy that pretends to be like it is called false hypothetical syllogism. What is its pattern? It will say all mangoes are fruits, then it will leave the fruits there, consequent there, and come and take all mangoes are edible. So there is no link. See, all mangoes are fruits, then it will leave it there. That one is wrong. Then you come off mangoes are edible. Sometimes you should say all mangoes are fruits and leave it there. They say all edible things are also fruits. Therefore, they will jump the line and all mangoes are edible. What that one does is that they say two different things meet at the same place. They all have a common consequence. So see, I said it this way. All mangoes are fruits. Then you leave the fruit there. Then you come and think all edibles are also fruit. So you make two different antecedents, but they both have a common consequence. Then you conclude, therefore, that the antecedents are connected. So all mangoes are fruits, all edibles are fruits. Therefore, you conclude that all mangoes are edible. We say that is a fallacy. You have jumped the gun. You didn't go by the bridge. What did Jesus tell you? If you don't come by the door, you're a thief. You have entered, but you're a thief. You know, so have that in mind. So the fact that two things converge at one place doesn't mean the two things are the same. I use that example of, I'll say, the, the pastor may go to the bar, the drinking place, you know, to go and do his or her own thing there perhaps to convert someone. And then the, the one who drinks, you know, or the pickpocket, they say, may also go there. So they may meet at the bar. Doesn't mean necessarily that the pastor and the pickpocket are the same. You see, I use such examples so you can always remember. So all men may wear uh, what, may wear a tie, and all women may also wear a tie. It doesn't mean that all men are women. Doctor, if to be a doctor, I could say all doctors study hard. All philosophers study hard. I'm talking about medical doctor. It doesn't mean all medical doctors are philosophers just because they share something in common or they have a common consequence. In the script. So if you did that, they will say that fallacy is what a false hypothetical syllogism.
That one is the wrong one. So what is the correct one again? You would want to play back, but I'll say it now. When I say all A's are B's, and all B's are themselves what C's, then you can conclude, therefore, that all A's are C's. That is hypothetical syllogism, and it is straightforward. Correct. Three sets to uh, There's no particular plotting. If you were plotting, you wouldn't put any specific there. You are not dealing with an existential. Yeah, okay, it's fine. No, no more elaboration. Let's go on to disjunctive syllogism. Okay. Just a minute. So where we have all, oh, all, oh, all, oh, it could have been if X is a mango, then X is a fruit. And if X is a fruit, then X is edible. Therefore, if X is a mango, then X is edible. We didn't say anything different. We just opened it out to show that each of the universal was on, on its own, what a conditional. So if I say all mangoes are fruit, I said if X is a mango, then X is a fruit. Okay, that is it. Now, disjunctive syllogism is also valid. See the pattern? You say you either say that Barclays or Stanchard. Then the next premise should say you do not say that one of them. So, you do not say that back. Therefore, you say that the other one. I could have said, you do not say that stand chart. Therefore, you say that back. What is important is that the negation of one of the options is done in the premises. You negate one. Remember, it is either or. So not one. Then I can conclude it is the other one. It would be wrong to say that A or B. A, therefore not B. That is not wholly correct, logically speaking. In my instance on the board, if I say I say that backlist or stand chart, then the next premise I said I say that backlist. So you are concluding therefore that I do not say that stand chart. You can see how problematic that would be. I could have two accounts, the inclusive sense, where I have an account at backlist and also at stand chart. So disjunction is tricky. We're doing element of formal logic. We would have opened it up to show the possibility, the various ways you could want to interpret disjunction. It is for that reason that you cannot affirm, if you like, let's say that way. You cannot say that one of the options has come, therefore the other cannot come. No, it's an either or. You come to my house, I'll give you fufu, or I'll give you. Uh, what porridge, fufu or porridge. If I do not give you one, then you will expect the other. That one is fine. That's the logic of it. You can accept that. But if I gave you one, you can't say because I've given you one of the options, the other one cannot come. Not necessarily. Both can. I could give you both. I could say, oh, I even plan to give you one of them. But the other person can't even come. So you can have a cocoa too. You too, the so, I have a point to see. So the point is what? For disjunctive syllogism, the correct pattern is what? A or B. It's an or, not if then. So A or B. Next premise should say what? Not A. Then you can conclude, therefore, what? B. It's an alternative. So not one of them. It has to be the other. Be careful not to go and say not one, therefore not the other, because you are used to move students and it's double, you know. Negate here and then negate it. No, this is disjunctive syllogism. So not one, the other, whichever one comes. Next. Okay. Now we can look at the fallacies. I've already showed them to you, but now you can pictorially see it, and then you can be plotting on your own when you are at home. You can use symbols and illustrations that can easily be accessible to you for your understanding. Formal fallacies simply refer to an error in the form of deduction. I said that already. You do not deduce according to the correct form or pattern. We will label that as what? A formal fallacy. This is not an informal fallacy like what we see broadly in Unit 10. Here, there are forms or patterns that you should follow. So if you deviate from that form, we have some common deviations, like I said earlier, which are so close so much like the original that they have attained a name for themselves. Okay. So those are the ones we've seen already. I just walk you through them. On the screen, you see the fallacy of affirming the consequent value. When we said all X's are Y's and we want to do modus ponens for the correct one, 
we should just say this thing is an X. So we would have followed that, therefore it is a Y. But here, the, the photocopy is never like the original. Try to be yourself. Be better at being yourself, though, by looking at models that inspire and make you better. But try, even in looking at others, to be yourself. Why? Because there is none like yourself, your very good self, if you improve upon your own self. You see, you can't be a photocopy of the other pe person and ever think that you'll be the original. A photocopy is always replicating what someone is. So until the person moves, you don't move. This is what is happening to our fallacy here. It's trying to be something, but because it is not original, there will be always a bad song. See, now this one says, all oh, X's are Y. This thing is a Y. We don't do this, okay? If then we conclude, therefore it is an X. We already see the problem with that. Why we say this thing is affirming, see the how affirming the concept. I'm hopeful that people will get this quickly. Now see the second fallacy, which already we already saw, denying or negating the antecedent. If you are denying or negating, then you are trying to be modus stolen. But this is not done properly, so we have a problem. All X's are Y, this is our consequent Y. This is our antecedent. We want to do the correct one. What we should say next is that this is not a Y. Then we conclude peacefully that then it is not an X. That would have been valid. This photocopia <laughs> uh, on probation forever, uh, uh, plagiarist for life, didn't copy as well. So it says all X's are Y. The next time says, this thing is not an X. We already saw that if you negate a mango, all mangoes are fruit, and you say not mango, you can't say, therefore, it is not a fruit. It won't follow necessarily. It could be not a mango, but still inside a set of fruit, perhaps because it's a banana. Okay. Now, the false hypothetical syllogism I showed you minutes ago. If two different antecedents share a common consequence, it does not mean the two antecedents are the same or identical. Remember, the pastor goes to the bar and the pickpocket also goes there. So they, meet, they would have what bar as their consequence, yet you cannot say pickpocket and pastors or vice versa. They are not the same. Every table is a furniture, every chair is a furniture, so every table is a furniture. That is a fallacy. You already saw that. Okay, so now on the screen, I have managed to put a, the, the original and it's fake show you how to detect the false courage. So I put the original down and I put the fake and I show you that if you mold it this way, you crash it this way and you dropped it, the original will spread itself out again. The fake one will remain stuck for the, the, the material that was used to do the fake cannot meet the standard of the original. So I'm showing you by putting the two together. Okay, see modus ponens, heavy smokers have lung issues. Kofi is a heavy smoker. They are affirming the antecedent here, so he has lung issues. That's so correct because we affirm the antecedent. Now, see what the fake copier guy did. That heavy smokers have lung issues. Then he says, Kofi has lung issues, so we should insist that he is a heavy smoker, not necessarily. So, this is a fallacy. And to Tola is the same thing. Heavy smokers have lung issues. Kofi does not have lung issues. If he is totally outside of the horizontal set. Did I say horizontal? The, the rectangle, whichever. Okay, who is out of it? Okay, remember all heavy smokers, all heavy smokers are inside the set of those who have lung issues. And Kufi is not even inside the big set, he's out of it, outside of Ghana. How can he be inside a crowd? Which when a cry itself is inside God, see the problem. So if Kofi is outside of the big set of heavy, uh, of uh, uh, those who have lung issues, then he will automatically not be even part of this set. That's why this is bad. We have seen that already. But here, the person says Kofi is not a heavy smoker, so we should take it that he's not those, he's not part of those who have lung issues. We think that is a fallacy. That's why we put our red mark there. Again, hypothetical syllogism, all mangoes are fruits, all fruits are edible. We've seen all of that already. 
Therefore, all mangoes are edible. This is valid. But the first one is the one saying all mangoes are fruit. All bananas are also fruit. So you should conclude that all mangoes are bananas. And we say, no, we're not going to do that. That's a fallacy. We didn't see the one for uh, disjunctive syllogism because your textbook doesn't touch on that. But there's a false disjunctive syllogism also. We can only learn what we will expect from our, our exam. At least that's fairness since we are focused in the textbook. Okay, so but you know that now. Now, some one or two points on that. And if it is not too lengthy, then I could go to generalizations in particular. If it is lengthy, I'll just cut it so you have some 50 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes to see the valid forms and they are fake copies, concise. So when you take it, you know this one, I'm learning the valid forms, then you can also go to another one. It helps to understand the real. See, validity versus soundness of a data. I already touched on that in part one. I said an argument may be valid and its premises may not be true. That one will say it's valid and will applaud it for being valid. But in the case in person, we will say in a, in a in person, this one doesn't sound well. It could be valid, but we may say it doesn't sound well. When do we say that? Oh, simply, simply when we have a valid arguments, but then the premises are not true. What we're saying is not true in actual observation, okay, in the actual state of affairs. Then we'll say it is valid, but not sound. But where you have a valid argument, that is the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises, valid. Yet, uh, excuse me, and its premises are also true. Then we'll say, oh, that was a sound, so it means soundness is an extra you have added to the quality of an argument. Not just is it valid, but it has true premises also. Let me say it is sound. Okay, that's what I put on your screen. So if I say all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That is sound. Mortality means men die, human beings. Okay, so all men are mortal, and Socrates is a man. That's true. And it is mortal. This is valid by modus pone. See what we did? And the premises are true. So that is sound. But the second premise, the second argument says, all human beings have feathers. This table is a human being. And this table has feathers. Now, this is also valid, like we saw earlier. It follows the same pattern. It affirms the antecedent. Our only challenge is it is not sound. Tables and human beings, factually speaking, and uh, human beings do not have feathers. Okay, so we can simply state that a sound argument must first be valid and then its premises must be true. I think that um, we don't have a very lengthy content. So, what do we do? What do we do? So I'll end this one so, so that I can label it the valid didactic syllogistic forms. You know syllogism already. You can play the other one too. And then I can do the third part where I am now into adding a bit on what universal particular, universal negation, universal affirmative, what have you. And then you can now join the ideas around it. And you should do excellently well for this unit. I think we can continue shortly. All the best.